Peter Byrne and I interviewed the man, and uh, we got the uh, the calls from the sheriff's department, and uh, and they were about two weeks apart. Uh, the two different calls. The one call, uh, the first one he made, is when his dog got killed. Now, what are you reporting? Uh, I got a strange going on out here. Something just killed my dog. Something killed your dog? My dog went flying through the air over the tree. I don't know how it did it. Okay. Damn, but I'm really confused. All I saw was my dog coming over the fence, and he was dead when she hit the ground. I didn't see any cars. All I saw was my dog coming over the fence. Well, I edited that. And got, I got we got the uh, Peter Byrne and I interviewed the man, and uh, we got the uh, the calls from the sheriff's department, and uh, I edited it down. So there's a lot of typing in between his his talking and, and the dispatchers talking, and they were about two weeks apart. Uh, the two different calls. The one call, uh, the first one he made, is when his dog got killed. He don't know how that happened because he said he seen it fly over the fence uh, uh, and it landed. Uh, we measured it 35 feet from the fence, and where it went over the fence, uh, he showed us a spot on the limb. It was like uh, there was a tree close by, nine and a half feet up, is where the dog come sailing over. And what he said he heard was a big thump. And this was like one o'clock, one thirty in the morning, something like that. He's working in his garage and. And when this happened, uh, he was very compelling, very, very uh, believable. And he was a Vietnam vet, and he was very sober. We, uh, I looked over the other side of the fence, looking to see if there's any horses or any sign of anything else, and couldn't find anything. Well, his dog was no, it was an older German Shepherd, a big dog, and uh, it was his favorite dog. Actually, he had two other smaller ones that used to always go out and yap and anything, but they came in and cowered, cowered down, and his German Shepherd went out, and that kind of. Him. Anyway, we tried to get the permission from him to dig the dog up. Uh, he wouldn't allow that, and uh, he just seems to stay out of the picture. He he knows what he saw, and, and he knows he saw a Bigfoot, but he didn't want to say a Bigfoot on on the on the to the dispatcher. They they might have laughed him off and not send anybody out. But uh, anyway, it was uh, very compelling his his uh, recount of that. It's on the, uh, actually on the Kitsap Peninsula, which is, I don't usually tell people that, but it doesn't really matter now. The guy doesn't live there any longer, I don't believe. 911, what are you reporting? Uh, we got someone or something crawling around out here. Did you see what it was? Was it a person or an animal or? I can't tell. All I know is that my central light came on and I just happened to glimpse and see this thing running across the yard. Uh, a good sized man or something that looks like a man. I don't know what it was, just that it ran across the yard. Okay. You've had problems in the neighborhood before? Yeah, my dog was killed here just recently. I don't know what it was. Whatever it is, it's running. I couldn't catch it if I was going to chase it. But whatever it was, it was standing up. I'm out here looking through the window now and I don't see anything. I don't want to go outside. Jesus Christ, you better... Sir? See ya. Hello? Get somebody out here. What's going on now, sir? That son of a bitch is about six foot nine, I don't know. Do you see him now, sir? Yes, I'm looking right at him. Uh-oh. Okay, hang on. He's right... Is he in your yard, sir? Yeah, God, he's big. Okay, what's he doing in your yard? He's looking at me. Oh, and the guy is on foot. Just... I don't know. what. It, it, it's, it's a big... Real big person. That's all I can say. Okay, but it is a it is a person. <laughs> yeah, I'd say it was a person or somebody really big. But he's all in black. He's is he a black male or a white male? Did you actually see whether or was he just wearing black? He's all black and he's big. He is big. He told us what he saw. That's what he saw. Uh, pretty much uh, that right there. He saw this thing looking at him. Standing. He had a car parked outside of his garage. He had these uh, these light sensors on the outside of his garage. And he had his garage doors closed, but he had the windows in his garage door. You know, like some of us do, let light in the daytime. And uh, this thing that uh, triggered the sensor light at the end of his car, which is right in front of his garage door. And uh, he looked out there and seen the thing looking at him, and uh, it really freaked him out. He, it was it was huge, and he didn't want to say seven foot something because again, it would have uh, maybe not allowed, not uh, got the police out there or the sheriff's department out there when they need to get out there right away. Oh, he also said a, a car went by and almost it went into the ditch and uh, almost hit it when it ran away, it went across those, this old dirt road out there where he lived. Pretty wooded area. So we thought we I think we, we ran an ad in the paper to see if anybody would respond to it, if anybody see anything strange on that road. 
and uh, didn't get any replies to it. I don't think she she didn't want to say it, and he didn't want to say it, but I think they may have been thinking the same thing, <laughs> um, that it was what it was. It looked like somebody was bent over and had their head in the window of the deer blind. It either heard me or smelt me, and he pulled his head out of the tent and stood straight up, and that that shocked me. They don't make people that that big. The way it moved. Uh, almost as if it was gliding across the beach. I've never seen anything move like that in my life. They were screaming at each other in gibberish. It sounded like a language and they were chuntering away back and forwards, back and forwards, back and forwards. I know what a bear looks like and there is no way on this planet that what I saw were bears. Out here. What's going on now, sir? That son of a bitch is about six foot nine. I don't know. Do you see him now, sir? Yes, I'm walking right at him. Uh oh. Hey, get away from that. Don't touch that. Bye, Unta, Unta. I can't stand those Jawas. Disgusting creatures. Does Sasquatch have a language? Over 30 years ago, Claire was on a business trip from the UK to America. She was staying in California, and on her downtime, decided to go check out the beach. Well, I'd actually gone out, and this is probably going to sound mad to uh, people in America. We don't have sea otters in the UK, and I'd gone out to photograph sea otters in Monterey on the Saturday there is uh, a trail that's quite an open trail. It's more like a path that goes down to a beach. It was great. There's a load of rocks on the uh, far side. So I wandered up there, sat down. I got my camera bag with me, taking photos, and was really the, just waiting for the sort of uh, sundown. Yeah, we have an expression, someone's walked over your grave. You really feel quite... Um, yeah, your hair stands on, on end, you feel cold. And I looked over to the way I would need to go back and there were, uh, I, I thought first of all, it was a huge cat, but it was much more big and bulky than a cat. And then there was more than one of them as um, they came round the promontory where you've got the cove shape. And I have never seen anything like it in my life. Um, very, very large, very hairy, moving on all fours. And there were several of these creatures, one behind the other. It obviously wasn't a cat because it was moving in a very strange manner. And the head kept popping up as if it was sniffing and then... <sighs> It popped up. It stood up on two feet. Uh, there was no other way to describe it. Must have been seven to eight foot tall. It was followed in onto this, this cove by two other five to six foot, maybe just over six and a half foot, and three much smaller ones. Uh, 
the larger one, which was definitely male, um, waded into the ocean. The two others, the two larger ones, which were, I would have said, females, uh, sat down on the sand with the smaller ones. The smaller ones were digging in the sand. The large creature, the really large one, um, was ripping out seaweed and throwing it back towards the females. And they were chewing the like the roots where it had been pulled out of the water and r rubbing it onto their chests and around their necks um, and then draping it around over their shoulders. So I am, um, I've just sat there, I'm just watching this, I, I can't say I was actually thinking anything more than stunned um, and probably like the idiot I am, I just thought, well, <laughs> no one's going to believe this. I'll take some photographs of it. So lifted the camera up to take photographs. Part of the um, lens kit dropped off, hit the rocks, went bouncing down where I was sat. And the large uh creature turned round, every, every one of them snapped round and was staring toward me, uh, at which point the male that was in the water basically was up to its, um, I'd say, mid-chest in the water, came striding out of the water. I've never seen anything move like that in my life. And... Um, Basically, it, it looked the way it moved, uh, almost as if it was gliding across the beach. One of the females, the larger one of the two females, came after it. And probably about 30 yards or so away from me, they, it, they had an argument, for want of a better word. Uh, they were screaming at each other in gibberish. The, the, the male that was in front was, it didn't take its eyes off me, but it sort of rotated from the waist. The head didn't really turn. It rotated from the waist. And it was like if you see a couple in a shop, it was verbalizing with her. It sounded like a language and they were chuntering away back and forwards, back and forwards, back and forwards. And it was like, a couple having a domestic dispute. Then it, um, the body turned right back at me and it just screamed. It, it, it was like no other sound I've ever heard. It was bellowing at me and effectively it just threw down and slammed its fists into the, into the sand and then stood up um, <laughs> It, it basically the last last thing I remember because I passed out I'm presuming I passed out I I was feeling incredibly sick <laughs> um was this thing mouth wide open big pink mouth and it it, it was obviously male it had an erection and it was urinating and that is all I remember uh, the word chatter, um, and we hear this a lot from, from witnesses, the word chatter itself, by definition, requires language. So, by the way, it does gibberish. If someone says, how do you know? I mean, I get this all the time. How do you know it's not gibberish? Well, if it's gibberish, it also requires language. Morphine streams that are put together that have no meaning. You must first understand articulated phonemes and morphemes have meaning. And therefore, you must, all, you, you must already have language, have the ability mm. for language before you can produce gibberish. Whether it's gibberish or chatter or whatever you want to call it, it's still language. Scott Nelson is a retired Navy man. He describes himself as the last person in the world who would have ever given Bigfoot a second thought. He describes his role in the Navy 
and what led him to study the Sierra Sounds. I spent a career in the Navy as, a, as what we call a cryptolinguist. My official title was uh, Cryptologic Technician Interpreter. And what we do, our, our main job is to uh, go out uh, to tactical platforms and collect uh, the human voice on tape and um, to copy as much of it as we can live. But what we can't, we, we record and then we go back and transcribe it. And we're trying to collect uh, languages that are not actually even our target language. And we're trying to recognize different languages and, and uh, get those tapes to the people uh, that can use them. As it applies to what we're doing now, the most important thing I did, I spent thousands of hours listening to the human voice on tape and transcribing language that, that I may not have actually known. I may not have been proficient or fluent in the language that I was transcribing, which makes me perfectly suited for transcribing a completely unknown language. It was 2008. I remember it very well. Uh, my son was 12 years old. We were sitting in my classroom at the college, and he... Um, he was doing a, a project for, for school. He was writing a report, and he decided he wanted to do it either on, you know, he was a 12-year-old boy, so he wanted to do it either on UFOs, Loch Ness, Monster, or, or Bigfoot. And so we're, I'm on Google, and we're just Googling stuff for his report. And he says, Dad, what do, you think, what do you think Sasquatches sound like? So I said, well, let's, let's Google it and find out. So I literally Googled Bigfoot sounds. And it immediately took me to the BFRO website where they had some snippet of uh, audio of Ron's uh, tapes, Ron and Al's tapes. I started playing them, and immediately I recognized that there was language there. And it was I, I'm at, at real time, listening to it through the first time, my son said, Dad, how can you tell that there's language there? Because it sounds like, it sounds like a bunch of apes fighting to me. And I said, I said, son, we need to get a hold of these tapes. We need to slow them down like Dad used to do in the Navy. And I guarantee you there's language here. So I knew it almost immediately. We're in for a night, Bill. Thank you. 
Ron Moorhead, who recorded the Sierra Sounds over 50 years ago, recalls what it was like to hear that in person. That was the, one of the first times I ever really responded or played with us while we were outside. I say play with us because that's what I think they were doing. Yeah. Uh, while we were outside the shelter, we, Bill and I, just the two of us were up there, and we were uh, by the stove fixing our dinner, and uh, I write about this in my first book, Voices in the Wilderness, but we we had activity just right as soon as it got dusk. We started hearing them pounding on rocks and, and breaking limbs and stuff, and and before they wouldn't do that until we were inside, the whooping and all that. Then they began, and like I tell people, if you just ignore them, they start coming closer. Don't get up and jump around and shine your flashlights up. Get rid of them quick. But uh, anyway, uh, I didn't. We didn't. We just kept doing what we was doing. And first thing you know, they start, I thought, asking me something. So I got up and yelled back at them and mimicked them. And they thought, I think they, th- I think they thought that was funny. Of course, uh, we we didn't know what to think. Really, you don't know because you're not you weren't we weren't none of us up there looking for Bigfoot. It's like something just happened, and uh, is anyway. It's uh, exciting. Let me back up to one minute though, Wes, if you don't mind. Explain something uh, to your listeners. Uh, Scott mentioned the morphine stream. Uh, that's that's what sets this apart. Is a morphine stream, which is a group of words that make up a cognizant sentence, or I should say, a sapient sentence. In this case, is if I'm saying something wrong, Scott, correct me. But um, these okay. things, we knew they were talking. We knew they were conferring with each other. But until you have an expert like Scott uh, listen to them and and declare, you know, with his credentials, declare that it is a language by the human definition of language, and that's what separates it from animals is it has a morphine stream and until you get somebody like that to say it's a language you can't just go tell everybody where they speak to you or you can tell that but they're not going to believe you i didn't know a man like scott existed i didn't even know until he found us and al Barry and myself and came out and talked with us but anyway i just wanted to clarify that just a little bit because it makes a big difference it's not just two animals communicating sure. It's two animals communicating, or two entities communicating with each other in a in a in a language by the human definition of language, which I think is critically That's important, correct. because only humans are are supposed to have language as we have it, with uh, wisdom and thought behind it. And from my experience with these things years ago, uh, they are clever. 
They're, they have defi- they have definition behind their moves. They know what they're doing. We underestimated the heck out of them, as I've told you a lot of times. So I don't want to take up all the time here, but it's uh, no, it's uh, it's just good. But prior to that, Al Berry had, had engaged a, um, Professor Curlin to to study those sounds. He did a year-long study. This is a professor, and he did a, a University of Wyoming. He did the study and said these tapes are real. And that's what's important because a lot of people send uh, sounds to Scott that haven't been studied by anybody professional, by uh, an engineer to see if there wasn't a 60-cycle hum in them, which would have shown pre-recording or re-recording. But uh, Professor Nell, or Pro- <laughs> Professor Curlin uh, <laughs> made the statement that that they, they showed no sign of uh, speeded up or slowed down or manipulated in any way. He even gave the actual size of the vocal mechanism, which would compare to a man's and how big this one was that he studied that one sound on. But I just want to clarify that a little bit because I think it's good for your listeners to, to understand what we're saying when, they, when we say they got language. The ones we dealt with in the Sierras have language. I don't know that they're all the same. I want to put that out there because I don't know that all of them can speak. Monkeys, apes uh, don't no. communicate like this, like these things do. No, they don't have the apparatus to to communicate with the the articulations that are on the uh, Barry Moorhead tapes. Whatever this creature is on the Barry Moorhead tapes is articulating with the same apparatus that human beings have, except maybe four times larger. I played what I call some of the monkey chatter for Claire, and asked her, "Is this what you heard?" Yeah, that's it. I was curious on what she thought was going on. Did she think the female was trying to talk the male out of killing her? I think if she hadn't been there, we wouldn't have be having this conversation, Wes. You know, for, for whatever reason, um, it, what I have, I have absolutely no doubt, and this is in hindsight because at the time I wasn't thinking of anything. I have no doubt, having stared into its face, that um, I don't, I would have been dead. I would have been dead. It was absolutely sheer, unbridled hatred and anger. Nothing, nothing more. Scott Nelson goes on to describe the three things that he concluded after investigating the Sierra Sounds. I knew three things immediately. Uh, one, that it was not a human being. And no, I'm not a, I'm not a sound uh, I'm not a sound specialist like Dr. Curlin. He had already established that, which I didn't know at the time. So I'm going I'm going um, only on professional experience. I knew immediately that it was not a human being. Because he was making sounds that was that were way above the ability of humans and way below. The second thing I knew immediately is that it was that it was an articulated language by the human definition of it. We're not talking about like coyotes have you know having some form of communication. You know, I mean, <clears throat> hell, dogs can do that. Other species can do you know communicate, but they don't have language by the human definition of it. But immediately, that was one of the things that I knew. And the third thing was that from my professional experience, I knew also that it could not have been faked. I had been trained in the best best deception techniques in the world at that time, which were the Russians. And there was no way that even the Russians could have done it. They they certainly could not have done it in 1972 and 1974. So those were the three three conclusions that I that uh, I knew to be true even before I I got up from my desk that day. When he listened to the Sierra sounds, what's fascinating is in one recording they sound like this. monkeys fighting over something. In another recording, it sounds more like some weird ancient language. Scott Nelson goes on to explain. And this is one of the big differences between the Barry tape and the Moorhead tape. 
is the Barry Tate, uh, they are all speaking at, at, at such a prosody or a, a rate of deliverance that is way too fast for humans to e- even recognize it as language. But on the Moorhead tape, when Ron is up there, I feel, and after you know discussing this with Ron many times, he feels the same thing, that they were actually trying to slow their, slow their articulations down as if they were actually trying to communicate with Ron and Bill. And, and people ask me, you know, well, how do you know it's not mimicry? I said, well, because the only person, the only creature doing any mimicry is Ron. Ron's trying to mimic the creatures in that, ta- in that cut you, that you just played. So that, that, you will hear, they are actually trying to purposely slow their articulations down now, I believe in an attempt for Ron and Bill to, to understand them. They were trying to communicate. What we're dealing with is what it's actually been dealt with in, in uh, philosophy and psycholinguistics, uh, specifically by, by uh, Dr. Willard Quine, a linguist and philosopher who's, who uh, over 50, some, 60 some odd years ago wrote a paper on what would happen if we ever discovered a language that was entirely unknown and entirely unrelated to any other human language, how would we translate it? It, He called it radical translation. So that's really what we're doing for the first time, probably in history, trying to understand what they're saying. We're really, (laughs) there's really no, I mean, we can, we can, it's all guesswork as far as the actual translation and that's what people mistake a lot of times when I say that I'm transcribing it. They think that I'm, I'm translating it. It's a completely different thing. I but we you. don't have to know what they're saying to, in order to, to prove that they are using language. And, and in order to actually get an accurate translation, like I've told Ron many times, I mean, you'd have to sit down with a Sasquatch and say, exactly what did you mean by this articulation? Did you mean tree or water or human or exactly what's in order to actually translate a completely unknown language? That's what, what, what would be required. Makes you wonder about the different sounds that Sasquatch does. I mean, in the Sierra sounds, they sound very human like, uh, kind of human like, uh, but they're projecting some sort of language. And then in other situations, they sound very animalistic like in the Michigan recordings. other times they sound like something mechanical like an air raid siren like in the Ohio howl In 1973, in Washington State, the Puyallup Screamer uh, sounds like some demon screaming out in the woods. So we have very animalistic sounds, we have very human-like sounds, we have sounds that sound like air raid sirens, and then they also mimic. 
many, many, many eyewitnesses talk about them mimicking what they say. We heard some of the mimicking there with Ron going back and forth with the creatures, but uh, that's not the only time that something like that's ever happened. I get down there, and this thing's pacing me, and I'm like, David. I'm yelling. I'm thinking it's David. I'm like, hey, is that you? And I walk a little bit more. And this thing is perfectly timing my my tromping through the weeds because I'm tromping and I stop real fast and I can hear clunk clunk. This thing is pacing me like a human, and and I'm freaked out. And then this thing with the loudest and look, man. I, okay, I don't know that that it was Bigfoot. Okay, I don't know what it what it was. You can call it a Neanderthal, as far as I'm concerned. At this point. Bigfoot's not in my mind. I'm thinking meth head, you know, pot growers, you know, some country bumpkin down here trying to mess with me. I don't know. But out of nowhere, this voice was so loud and it said his name. David. David. Clear as a bell, but but demonic sounding. I mean, I mean, ear splitting loud. I mean, I I was so shocked, I didn't even know what to do. I was just sitting there like, I, I don't even understand what's happening. Is this David yelling his name? I mean, I don't know what to do. And then it laughed with the most hideous, crazy, satanic voice. It laughed like a human. I mean, just, just but super loud. And I remember when it laughed, it was so loud that it vibrated my clothing. It, I could feel the, the, I could feel it so loud. It was hitting my body. I mean, it made my, it made my clothes move. I, I mean, it vibrated me like my body. And at that point, my, my little voice in my head said, you need to get up that tree and you need to get up that tree now. And I got up in that tree and I've, and I, and I, I, I think I, scraped and cut myself all up trying to you know i was just going up so fast i was just hitting them stops with my hands and i was pulling and I, I got up there and i've got this little cheesy flashlight and i'm like david if that's you i'm gonna kill you you know i'm screaming and hollering and then this thing retreats a little bit because i haven't got good i've got good distance on it you know i'm up i'm elevated this thing's probably 15 foot up maybe eight i don't know it was it's up in the air it's up, to, it's up off the ground a ways. And, and I get up there and I'm shining this light and this thing, you know, I told you there's, there's, there's tall weeds down here and I never got a super good look at it. Okay. It was just like a, it's, it's like a, it was like huge. I mean, it was, it was like, it was like maybe four feet wide where it would push the, the, you know, where I would see it coming out of the weeds. And I shined my light on it, and I was just like, oh, my God, this is nothing like I've never seen before. I couldn't see real good detail, but I could tell this thing just, it's huge. This this space that this thing is displacing, and it was black. You know, it, you, you could see a good contrast because those weeds were tan. They were like a light tan. And this thing was making a good contrast on them weeds. So, yeah, I could see that. I couldn't see real good detail, but I could see that. And after hearing this voice from hell, say his name i mean i didn't know what to, i thought it was just you know i'm not thinking bigfoot but i told i told whatever this was one more time if you if you don't leave i will kill you i am going to shoot i'm going to kill you and it it kept on a, trying to test me so i fired the type of vocalizations that they use you know every you guys have heard of the lion roaring uh, all across the spectrum, different type of vocalizations that they use really makes no sense to me. If it's he- if it's human-like, you would think it would speak some language, which it apparently does. But then we as humans don't really make animalistic sounds. It really makes no sense. It's certainly strange to us humans. It's something that, w- you know, we don't understand. But uh, it's easier to understand why they would do it. Uh, for the purpose of deception. Now, now, Ron and I both have experienced sounds up there that were not even animalistic. 
we've heard sounds up there that were almost mecha, um, metallic. We've heard sounds like cowbells. Ron's heard things that are very electronic. Weird, I mean, stuff that are, go beyond weird. And so, and, and the community as a whole has, has pretty much concluded that these creatures can mimic virtually any sound. I've heard them do owls, and but, but owls and, I mean, 800-pound owls, and there's three of them, you know, mimicking the human owl sound. It's just, it's, uh, it's unbelievable their, their ability to mimic any kind of sound. The range that Dr. Curlin shows on his uh, graft and in the book, uh, Mind Like Monsters on Trial, he, uh, he shows their, their vocal ability pretty much uh, on a graft. You know, the sounds that he took out and put on a graft and how they compare to a human. Mm -hmm. And they go way above, inside, and way below what we can do, which shows me and tells me their vocal mechanism is, is much superior to ours, and they can probably have the ability to mimic just about anything. What they can't deceive you with is their aptitude. The power in which it comes out is unbelievable. It just uh, it, it'll jar you when you hear it. Um, but anyway, uh, we also had another uh, sound expert years ago, uh, Nancy Logan, who um, chimed in on this, mm -hmm. and she said, "Whoever did this just wasn't human. It couldn't, couldn't. You know, humans can't do this. The rapid speed articulation, um, the range in which they have, and uh, but you you put all that together, and, and you've got a lot of information here coming out of the emotions that these things portray with their with their sounds and." And you got you got this uh, still this mentality of a lot of researchers out there that think they're looking for an ape in the woods, and uh, they're more than that. And I just <laughs> like to get that point across: they're not just an ape running around the woods. And uh, anyway, just wanted to throw that in there. I'm in agreement with Ron. I I don't think it's an ape. Uh, you know, the other thing too, and as you listeners have heard the show. Uh, gosh, almost 800 of them now, uh, where people talk about, gosh, I heard two people talking out in the woods, but it was some weird language I couldn't quite understand, but it was some, I could hear these two people talking back and forth. There's sections of, of the berry tape, especially, where they almost all of their articulations are essentially twice as fast as, as those of humans' ability. Um, where when you, you slow some of those down and they, to approximately 50% of real time, and they sound very human. After almost 800 shows, I could play example for you. I mean, example after example after example of eyewitnesses talking about that weird chatter. And a lot of them can kind of mimic back what they heard, the weird gibberish. Uh, it's hard to know what Sasquatch is. Uh, does Sasquatch have a language? In my opinion, apparently. Uh, but I will leave it up to you to make up your own mind. I really hope you guys enjoyed the show tonight. If you've had an encounter, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. Until next time, everyone.